Okay, so three related but diff different topics uh, today. So the first, first is this uh, the concept of navigator scans, uh, which are which is like a quick and dirty scan that you do before your main scan to try to fix your your main scan. And it's, uh, all, you know, we've already talked about Grappa, which is sort of like that. Um, but uh, I'll I'll go over several several different practical things that are done, like, for instance, for every single functional MRI slice uh, that involves, involves a navigator, uh, navigator echo. And then I'll talk about uh, EPI versus spiral distortion. And this sort of presupposes, unfortunately, the main lecture. <laughs> so, uh, so if this doesn't make sense, then look at the main lecture first. And then I'll talk about gradient nonlinearities, what, what effect that has. And several of these things are, are related to the two main theorems I'm going to talk about in the main section, which is the Fourier shift theorem, Fourier phase shift theorem, and the Fourier frequency shift theorem. Uh, so, um, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually using them now. So, so go to the main lecture. So, um, so navigators. So, one of the the first kind of things that people used navigators for was uh, if you're imaging something like the lungs, uh, I've mentioned this before, you know, the diaphragm's going up and down. And so um, it, it's moving. It's actually a non-rigid movement <coughs> of the lungs. But if you could sort of image the diaphragm, find out where the diaphragm is, and if you want to see, see the bottom of the lungs where there's a lot of, you know, problems... Um, better than uh, if you could quickly find out where the bottom of the uh, you know bottom of the lungs are, then you could use the main scan uh, to make a clearer uh, picture of the lungs. So that's kind of one of the one of the very er early early uses of uh, of navigators. Um, but um, let's just talk about one that's that's used essentially before every. Um, you know, every EPI functional MRI image slice. So uh, I started off uh, at the very beginning, the very first lecture, I said, uh, you put the superconducting current into, the, into the, the coils, the main sort of B0 coils, and it just goes around by itself, and it's not plugged in. And it just, it just stays on. You can turn off the, unplug the magnets, it's uh, current still going. So that's basically true, but it turns out it, it slowly ticks down. <laughs> and what causes this? Well, you're, you're sticking stuff in and out of the magnet. And so, the, so basically what can happen is you can slowly bleed off a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of the energy that's in the, you know, the superconducting uh, current that's, that, that's, that, that's in the actual coils. And it, uh, so there's... Uh, there's a B0 downdrift. Now, it's a very small one because, you know, you, you, you can, the superconducting, as long as you keep the, the coils cold, the superconducting current will stay in there for decades, no, no problem. I mean, ours is, you know, you, you, you can leave the magnet up for literally decades and it, and it won't go down very much. So what is it? It's about uh, 0 0.05 parts per million per hour. So that's not very much, but it turns out that the, the center frequency, uh, essentially, uh, your estimate of the center frequency uh, is crucial for uh, getting the phase of the uh, data uh, correct. And if the phase is off, somehow the case-based data phase is off, that corresponds to a, a, a shift. That's the Fourier quote-unquote, phase shift theorem. For, they usually just call it Fourier shift theorem. Um, and so that amount is actually enough to move in an EPI scan. That's enough to move like uh, almost a full voxel uh, in one, one or the other direction, that, that downward drift. And so, so basically th this leads to a, a phase shift. And that... Uh, eventually leads to an image shift. Now, uh, there's different 
directions that it might shift, and we'll talk about that in, in the main, main lecture. But um, so what do you normally do? Uh, you normally do, before you do every scan, every single scan, you do a, a frequency pre-scan, which is uh, an attempt to find out what the center frequency currently is. And so before every scan, you do that to sort of take care of this, this slow drift. Um, but if you're, if you're recording really, really rapid scans, like, you know, like 20 slices per second or 15 slices per second, there's no way you can, you can do one of these um, frequency pre-scans for every slice. But, uh, like I said, it's enough, it's enough to actually cause, you know, a visible shift. Uh, like, a, it's, it's even faster than what I said. It's about a voxel over the space of, say, five minutes. And so that's, that's a substantial shift that we'll, you'll have to uh, take care of. And so what, uh, what the scanner manufacturers have done is, uh, couldn't we just try to measure that really quickly? Because that's a, that's a, that's a relatively straightforward thing. And so basically what is done for functional MRI, EPI type scans is for every single slice, attempt to measure what the, effectively what the, the center frequency is or the center phase is. And so the way you do that is if you've got, so normally, so the, you know, the, the original idea was that you start at the center, you, you do an RF pulse, which puts you at the center of K-space, and then you go down to the, lower left corner and then go back and forth uh, really quickly. And so, uh, so what, what do we do instead? So <coughs> instead what we do is start at the middle <coughs> and then just go across and then turn around and go back and then uh, turn around and go, go across again, something like that. And then yeah, maybe go back again. Uh, these are all on top of each other, but I just drew them so you could see them. And then go down and then start recording. And so that, those, are the, those are called the navigator echoes. So this, this is the main image that we're recording. Uh, but these guys, these guys are the navigator echoes. Uh, you know, all at you know, k y equals zero. So they, they're just going, just going right through the middle of k-space, biggest possible echo. And <laughs> this is, I, I was looking at the lecture from last year. It's like, you know, in the old days, we used to walk 10 miles to school through, through snow. So back in the old days, what we used to do is just do this by hand. And so how would you do it by hand? You would, uh, you would, uh, do an EPI image, but with the blips turned off. So if you just turn off the blips, you won't go up, you, you, know, you won't go down to the corner of K-space and you, and you won't go all the way up. You'll just go back and forth across the center. And if you plot out all those echoes, th those are big echoes because you haven't changed your, your going to the center of K-space, uh, you know, what should you get? You should get all the echoes kind of lined up on top of each other like this. So there should be like a, a big bright, spot in the middle of the of the image but what can happen well uh, maybe it's off you know like maybe it's over here uh, the, the echoes are, are not uh, going right through the center now you'd think that that would be really bad it's actually not too bad <laughs> what we'll see in the main lecture that that you can't even see the effect of that if your echoes are not centered um, but something else could happen what if uh, you know what if um, the echoes are not lined up with each other like this. They're like offset, like the left and the right are offset. And what if it's like, it, what if it's slowly getting worse? <laughs> or, you know, what if instead you've got something like uh, your echoes are, uh, are sort of tilted like this uh, and they're sort of getting, you know, getting be the left and the right are lined up, but you're getting behind. And so, so back in the day, what we would do is we'd get this image and then we had a bunch of numbers that they were called tweakers. And you just like tweak the tweakers until you get everything sort of lined up in the middle. Uh, so obviously that was kind of like a time consuming uh, process. So basically what this is taking these echoes at the beginning before you even uh, record the data for every slice is 
is a good thing to do. And it's a very high signal to noise thing because you know, you're, you're uh, doing it at the very beginning when the signal is very big. And so you've got like a, a lot of uh, signal to work with. And so, so what, is, you know, what does that look like in the pulse sequence to cause this to happen? So you would select a slice. So we do the, you know, do the RF and select a slice. And then um, don't turn on the blips. Uh, and then just go across uh, K space a couple times. So what would that look like? So here's the, there's the first, um, that, that's where the big uh, FID comes out. And then at this point, oh, sorry. No, that was uh, one more line. Here's RF out. So that, that's where the, and so, so all we do to sort of go, go across K space, uh, we would just go across K space like that. And that, uh, let's see, if, if it, we're, we're starting right at the, the center of K space and we go uh, sort of halfway across K space. So halfway across K space like that. Then we go down, go back a, uh, across and get an echo. And then we get another echo. Uh, and then we get another echo. So, so basically what would happen is we would get like an echo here. And then we would get another one here. And then another one. These are just going across no blips, going across the center of K space. And then another one here. And so, and then finally, we would uh, go ahead and, and start collecting our our main main scan here so so basically this is the this is the main scan where we turn on the turn on the blips and so now we would collect all the rest of our data and and our real echo you know you know uh, our te effective would be way out here when we go through when we <coughs> go all the way through uh, the kind of center of k space so so basically, this is the, you know, this is the, you know, the image, uh, and these are the navigators here. And so, what can we, what can we do with the navigators? Um, so, uh, and what if things weren't quite right? You know, so so what if, you know, the. Uh, the echoes that we got back had the wrong phase. So there's several things we could do. Th wh and why would they have the wrong phase? They would have the wrong phase because we hadn't set the center frequency properly. So there's several things you could do. You could actually do the tweakers and fiddle with the gradients. Uh, but that's kind of a little fiddly to do very rapidly. So what we could do instead is we could just record what the phase was. And then once we've got all our data, hack the, the case-based data to fix the phase. And that's, that's typically, typically the way this is used. So basically, we, we take these echoes, um, and then we, you know, we fix, fix the phase in case-based data that we collected over here. So here's our, uh, so fix the phase in, in all, in all, you know, these echoes, which are our actual sort of, you know, imaging echoes. I, I left one thing out here. We have to, we have to sort of go down to the corner of K space. So there's going to be a, uh, there's going to be a negative, you know. Uh, it should be before we, before we start. So like, so right here, there's going to be. We're going to go down to the corner of, uh, the bottom of K space, and then. We're going to start doing our blips. These are the ones that will slowly advance us uh, upward and upward in k space in the ky direction. So, so this guy is you know go to corner. No bottom. Go to bottom. And so, so basically, it would just be like a regular scan, except you would just you know after. You've collected all the case-based data. Just 
uh, fix the phase in case-based data, you know, then reconstruct, you know, then, then ft minus one. And so, so that's a way of, uh, of fixing the data. And uh, you can also deal with the problem where the, if the echoes are a little bit, a little bit not quite right, it, it's called a zipper artifact, where, you know, where the, one echo from one direction is like that and the other one is like that. So, so what if that happens? You know, what if the left, the left and the right passes through k-space are not completely symmetrical? What will happen is you'll get a Nyquist ghost. And a Nyquist, the, the, the general meaning of that is that you didn't sample things fast enough. So, for instance, if you leave out every other line of k-space, you'll get a very strong, you know, ghost. And what does that ghost look like, you know, when we do the, you know, ft minus 1? It looks like here's where the image is supposed to be, like this. And it looks like you have, uh, when you don't sample fast enough here, it uh, causes a wraparound or it causes the replicas to intrude. And so what will happen is you'll have another copy of the brain that's, displaced by exactly half of the field of view. So this, so you'll, you'll see this, this brain sort of moved up by that distance. So you'll see another copy of the brain over here like that. And then you'll get another copy coming in the bottom. Uh, that's the other replica coming in the bottom. And this can obviously cause a lot of problems because, you know, say, you know, say you had a big activity here in visual cortex. Well, that's going to sort of like, there'll be a little copy of it up here in orbital frontal cortex. And obviously that could, uh, that could sort of mess up your interpretation of the data. Um, because, you know, it would just displace some of the activity to another, another part of the brain. If it's not too much, it's not going to hurt you too bad. But there's a lot of analysis methods where you attempt to look at what part of the brain uh, is correlated with what other part of the brain. And so there's, you know, like functional connectivity analysis. Like, are these parts of the brain sort of going up and down at the same time because maybe they're connected to each other and they're activating each other? If you have that thing going on, well, of course, those are going to be correlated. They're going to be perfectly correlated because they're exactly the same thing. <laughs> and so that could easily you know, easily mess up your analysis of, you know, the correlation and activity between different, you know, different parts of the brain. So, so it's good to sort of get, uh, you know, get rid of that. And, you, and, and having these echoes going uh, back and forth, you can tr attempt to estimate over time how the left and the right echo are, uh, are changing. So number of different things to do with it, but uh, to, to use this for, but basically what you can do is you can essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like doing a frequency pre-scan for every single slice. But, you know, you're collecting the slices, you know, every 80 milliseconds or something, or 70 milliseconds. And so, and so it's like a frequency pre-scan for every slice. And that gets rid of that, that drift uh, due, to the, uh, due to this, uh, uh, this effect of the, the slow, slow drift downward in the um, in the um, the B zero field. So that's just the main field, very, very slowly, sort of drifting, uh, slowly but surely drifting downward. Okay, so that's uh, that's an example of a navigate. Now, this question. Oh, to say, yeah. So, so typically, what you would do for, first, you would like take a localizer, you know, and the localizer would have a, a, a frequency pre-scan before it. So, the, so the localizer will be will be sort of in the correct place because you would have just done a frequency pre-scan before you took that. It took like you know, ten seconds or something, uh, uh, and then you get set up to do a bunch of, a bunch of functional MRI scans. And so you would you would pick your volume using that localizer. But then every single scan over the next five minutes would have one of these, these navigators to, to fix it and sort of keep everything in line. And if you didn't do that, well, you, know, you, you could easily, you can just turn it off uh, and you can just easily sort of watch the, you know, watch the images slowly drift. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, mo 
most people don't even realize this is being done. I mean, back in the day, you would just take all your images and uh, realign them post hoc. You know, so you could, you, there's several ways to fix it. You could just say, okay, well, I know there's going to be a drift in that, in that direction. And we'll assume that the first one, image was correct and we can line up all the other ones. But, you know, why not just collect a little more data and just fix it before it happens? So, so those are, that's one heavily used kind of navigator. And so the other, I mean, like the original navigators were basically for, for motion correction. And so what is, you know, what does that look like? And I talked about some of these other methods for, um, so this was for, you know, EPI, B0 drift. Uh, but you can also do this for, for motion correction. So, so obviously, wh why can you do it for motion correction? Well, one of the, the main things you could do is, you know, post hoc. So if you've got, uh, if you're collecting images every second or something like that, you could take the first one and just, like I said, you could just line up all the, the subsequent images to the first one. Uh, that works if you're collecting images rapidly, but, you know, uh, you know, can't do for 3D. So if you're doing a 3D scan, uh, you, you can't do that because you're collecting case-based data over five minutes and then you're reconstructing the image afterwards. And so if motion occurs during that time, it's going to mess up, mess up the case-based data in a way that you can't fix by trying to realign the image because you only get one image. So, so any kind of 3D scan uh, dealing with the motion is, is going to be a more difficult problem than a scan where you're collecting very rapid images and then you can sort of line them back up to each other. Um, there's another that I, I, I talked about this other method of uh, sort of aligning the images in real time. <coughs> and um, I, I call this one sort of one behind. <laughs> Uh, so how this this one basically works by um, you start with you know you collect an image a volume so and, and with an EPI you can collect a volume in like one second and then so that's that's time t1 and then you collect another volume uh, that's time t2 now you might have moved uh, in during time t2 and so so what you do is you you, you know, in, in this space right here, in between time T2 and time uh, T3, you quickly align. So, d so during, during that time, you quickly align this, uh, two to one. And then you figure out uh, what you need to do to the gradients in order to cancel the motion that occurred in time T2 when you collect time T3. So you take that thing, and then during this time, you know, fix gradients and RF. So uh, remember, you can move the slice with the RF. If you change the frequency of the RF, that will actually shift, shift where the slice is. And so, uh, and and then you can also change the gradients. And it, between the gradients and the RF, you can basically sort of rotate the cube however you want it and, you know, translate it X, Y, Z and rotate it however you want it in order to get it lined up. So you quickly do that. You only got like five or 10 milliseconds to do that. So quickly do uh, a rapid alignment, feed it back into the gradients, and now you fix three times time three. But, but obviously time T2, which was the one that you... you used to estimate the error is not fixed. And so you have to sort of like post hoc, go back and realign everything a second time. Uh, but you can keep doing this. You're always one behind, uh, but uh, you can, so like for time t f t4, at this time you align three to two and then fix the gradients so that four is, uh, and then when you're all done, you know, then, you know, at end, uh, 
uh, another align an another alignment another align to fix you know uh, one behind uh, because you're always one behind and this and this one works pretty well uh, but uh, it's obviously it would be better if you could somehow get the data quick enough so that we could sort of fix it before we've collected the data and that's uh, that's um, been attempted and it's starting to be implemented now and one method I've got a paper on it if you want to read about it uh, people sort of have been writing about this for 10 or 15 years it's still not really built into most uh, sequences on the scanner but you could do a spherical navigator <laughs> uh, and so the idea here is um, this would be particularly for a 3d scan so you do like really quick quick nav uh, and then uh, you know fix you know fix gradients before uh, data collect so uh, so you so you do this so you attempt to sort of measure the motion uh, very quickly and then um, and then when you actually collect a point in 3d k space it, everything's all lined up properly and so this this is a way of trying to fix a 3d scan because you can't fix a 3d scan with any of the post hoc methods because the data is already contaminated you know by the time you get the scan so um so how does that work so the so the spherical navigators spherical nav so the idea is what you want to do is is collect so here's your 3d k space uh, and so, so that's you know k y k x not real space uh, so k space and so what you want to do is very quickly collect just a single shell of k space and so why would you want to do that well first you know draw what it looks like so basically you start say do an rf pulse small rf pulse and then you know go go up to the top of k space and then and then sort of collect a sphere of k space like that you could do it in one or you know one or two two tries something like that so you end up with a uh, a single one point thick shell of k space so k space not real space and so so what so so first what is the pulse sequence that you would do to do that it has to be very quick and it's kind of a spiral like scan so so what it looks like is you know here's your rf and the the first thing you would do is do a small pulse not because we've got to collect the main pulse data and so we don't want to saturate all the spins so you know do do, do a pulse that's not too it doesn't kill too much of your longitudinal magnetization because it takes a long time for that to recover uh, and then uh you would uh, select the whole volume. So this is, you know, a slab here. So select the whole slab, and then, uh, and then we want to uh, collect all. So that was the the GZ, and then, so then in the GY and the GX, uh, what we want to do is quickly, quickly go through all of, all of K space, and so. Um, so in the z direction, we need to say put on. Uh, if we're going, say we go, say we go from the bottom to the top. So I'll uh, say start at the bottom here, and, and then and then start uh, start coming around like that. So so first uh, first we uh, go to the bottom of kz so so here we go to the, the bottom of kz and then uh, we slowly tick up and so how do we do that just turn on uh, on that gradient just 
at a low level. Uh, and then now we've got to go around and around. And so what's going to happen is, you know, first you'll, you'll be going, you know, small little wiggles, and then they'll get bigger like that. And then you'll have small little wiggles on this gradient, and they'll, they'll get bigger. But this will be like, say, cos. This will be like sine, so they'll be out of quarter degree out of phase with each other. And so basically what you could do then is just, you know, collect data going around that that shell of k-space. you got to do it really quickly, and that's the advantage of spiral. So you could do that in f five milliseconds or, you know, some two milliseconds, so some very small amount of time to just whip around k-space. Uh, and then at this point, well, and, then, and then we maybe put on some crushers to sort of get rid of any excess, uh, you know, magnetization because we don't want to mess up our, our main scan. So here's some, some crushers. And then... Then we would do, you know, you know, our you know, main scan, like, you know, you know, for example, MP Rage. So that would, at that point, then we would do another, you know, uh, say 90, or, you know, 180 and a 90. You know, for example, uh, you know, fast gradient echo. So, uh, and then, you know, that would be your main scan. But in this interim, you, you would have taken this data and figured out what the motion was. And so how do you figure out what the motion was from a spherical navigator? So the trick is, uh, if you've got at time T1, here's your sphere. So this is K space. And so if you plot, if you plot the amplitude of the data, you'll see some little sort of clouds in K space. So here's little, you know, and it's, it's at some arbitrary spatial frequency, like uh, like 35 or something like that, whatever. Uh, so it's, uh, but there'll be a certain amount of amplitude of that k-space signal. And then here's the sphere of data for time t2. And so what can happen to that data? So, um, so the data can rotate a little bit. And what does that correspond to? That corresponds to basically just the fact that uh, you've actually rotated the you've rotated the sample. You know, the person has rotated their head, and but we've stamped on we've stamped on the phase stripes because, like, what does it mean to sort of go through k space? It means it means stamp on all these different angle stripes of spin phase on, on, onto the brain. And if, if we rotate our head, we're still stamping them on in the same uh, 3D space position, but the head is rotated. And so what is that going to do? Well, it's going to effectively rotate the spin stripes on the brain. And then when, when we, you know, when we reconstruct it, it would, it would cause a brain rotation. But it will cause a rotation of the k-space data because you know what what is what do these spots mean they mean like there was you know at this particular angle of stripes there was a lot of stripiness <laughs> and if you rotate the brain it'll have the effect of sort of rotating where you know where that maximum in um, k-space signal was and so what you can do is you can say Okay, I can see, I can just do a quick and dirty alignment of these two spheres, and I can see that, you know, all these guys have rotated around a little bit. Uh, and so that will, so that basically will tell you, so you can align amplitude, and then th that, will, that will tell you the rotations. That will tell you the rotation of the, like how is the brain rotated. It won't tell you how the brain is translated. So how do you figure out the translation? Well, so the the translation is you know calc translation from phase. That Fourier shift theorem again from phase. And so what you do is you you just basically look at this guy and see what the phase difference is. 
and the phase difference will correspond to uh, correspond to the x y z translation and so you you'll have you know since since they're going around the whole sphere you'll essentially have enough information to to calculate the x y z translation so you, you so you'll you'll be able to figure out the rotation of the head and then the x y z translation of the head and then with that information um, you could you could then take these guys and feed them back in and you know fix so it, you fix the gradients uh, and the rf frequency and so so this is uh, especially for something like an mp rage uh, where you've got you, uh, some time like you, you you're doing an inversion pulse and you got some time to wait around this is a very practical practical thing to do so that you could actually essentially um, correct your case-based data before you collected it and this is definitely a problem you know like if you put a kid in a scanner and you're doing a four minute scan and they're sitting there and then oh, and they suddenly like in the middle rotate around it when you look at your image there'll be all these little streaks on the image from the the motion artifact and so this is a this is kind of a handy way to do it now the you know the another way of doing it one problem with navigators is you've got to mess up your data a little bit you know because we, we're going to collect some data here and then we've got to crush that magnetization and so we're we're slightly messing up our main data collection and so th the other method that i uh said is why don't we just you know put a camera in there so if you put a camera in there and then uh track a little marker so you could you could put two cameras in there so if you put two cameras, and we have this a system like this set up, so you put two cameras in there, and th and they look at a little marker, and you've got some little things on the marker, and you can do stereo on the stereo, you know, vision on the on the marker, and then figure out, and and that marker is mounted on the head. So here's the head. So here's the there's the head uh, guy looking forward. Yeah. So. So you basically what you could do is you could calculate where the head went to and then feed that back into the magnet. That has an advantage, you know, ca you know, camera to measure movement. It has an advantage. It doesn't mess up the, uh, it doesn't mess up the pulse sequence at all uh, because you, you're not uh, having to do extra pulses and collect extra data that interfere with your main data collection over here. Uh, but uh, the problem is you got to put a marker on, <laughs> and so there's so these are the, <coughs> these are the two kinds of approaches that are battling back and forth at the scanner manufacturers. It, obviously, it would be easier if we could do something that just collected a little extra data without having to tape a marker onto the person. Um, but it's kind of compromised the pulse sequence. This one is better in a way, but then you got to put the marker on. And so people have even tried, well, could we do it without a marker? Can we just like image the person's face? And actually, but you know, some parts of the face move relative to other parts of the face. So there's a lot of, a lot of, other, or could we just like paint little little dots with a with a sharpie onto their face and <laughs> which they can't see, and then uh, image those and figure out the motion from those. There's you know many different methods of doing this, but. Uh, this method, you know, spherical navigator, some kind of navigator method, has the big advantage that you don't have to, you don't have to add any markers or anything like that. It's just all sort of built into the pulse sequence. So, so that's another, another navigator, uh, navigator idea. So, what I want to talk about now is let's talk about these, uh, the kinds of distortion you get. And so there's you know, there's different kinds of distortion in these different pulse sequences, and then there's also additional spatial distortion that comes from the gradients not being ideally linear. So we'll talk about, quickly talk about both of those. And again, I'm going to go over this more slowly in the main, the main lecture uh, on the EPI, particularly on the EPI distortion. Why does that occur? Um, and uh, a lot of the problem with distortions occur in scans like EPI or spiral functional scans where we're collecting 
It's kind of, we're paradoxically collecting data more rapidly than we normally would. But at the same time, we're often doing that by uh, just doing one RF pulse and then recording data for longer than we normally would. And because of that, there's more chance for distortions to build up. So, uh, so what does that, uh, that look like? And, and where are these you know, problems particularly? Well, there, there's, there's some air, the olfactory bulbs are right there, and there's some air very close to the brain, uh, right, right under the frontal lobes. And there's also, there's also the, the ear canals, and that's a little tube of air right under the brain. So there's, you know, there's air inside there. And so what's going to happen is you, you'll typically have a bunch of distortion in this B0 distortion. So these are B0 defects due to the fact that you've got air right next to magnetizable stuff. And so... There'll, there'll typically be some distortion around the, around the uh, part of the brain that's right over the, the ear canal tube and, the, and, and some distortion over here. And there could be some, there's some sinuses in the back of your head where there's some air that can cause some distortion up here. So, um, so is there any way that uh, we can sort of look at what those B0 distortions do to the image. And the very simplest way to do it, uh, so we'll divide it into you know, spiral and EPI. So here's, here's EPI you know, versus spiral. So what, is the, what are the differences there? So let's just take the simplest possible situation, unrealistic situation compared to this. Uh, which is that, say we've got a spurious gradient that was on. We'll, we'll just do this one because it's, uh, it's kind of uh, simpler, to, uh, simpler to reason about. But it, can, it could actually happen in, in practice. So say this is the actual image. It's just a line. That's our brain. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, this is our brain. So we're imagine a spherical cow. So, so we start off with um, with with an image, and, and, and our our brain just consists of a line going across like that. Um, now, when we're collecting the data, uh, so so that's our image, and then we collect our k-space data. Uh, what happens? Well, we we go. So this is the image. This is k-space spatial frequency. So what happens is we start at the bottom, and then we start going back and forth like that. Uh, and what happens is it takes a long time to collect the data in the ky direction. And also, the blips are very small. So these huge gradients that are forcing us back and forth across k-space are kind of really big relative to the B0 defects. These tiny little blips that are moving us up k-space this way are really tiny relative to the to the B0 defects. And so what happens is the B0 defects build up and are worst at the top because there's been more time for a B0 defect to have affected the spin phase higher up in the, in the scan. So this is basically what I'm coloring in here is, you know, amount of phase error. And what is our what is our assumption? Assume that we have uh, you know a spurious gradient on. And let's assume that gradient is in the uh, uh, in uh, in the x direction. Okay. So how, how you know how could that happen in in real life? Uh, typically, what you do is. You're, you're trying to sort of correct these B0 problems before you start the scan. And so there's another pre-scan called a SHIM scan, which I talked about briefly. And what that does is attempts to estimate how bad the B0 uh, defect is. Now, say your estimate 
And how do you fix that? You fix it by turning on the shim coils. And what are the shim coils? They're coils that just add some uh, B0 field to flatten the B0 field. So say, and you can use the gradients for this. So say that there was like some spatial distortion that resulted in the B0 field being a little bit low on the left side of the left side of the head, left side of the head, there we go. <laughs> and uh, if you, um, you could cancel that with a gradient. So you, you, you put a little gradient on to slightly bring up the field in the left side of the head to make it flat again. Say whatever your estimate of how you did, you know, how much gradient you needed was wrong. That could easily happen. Uh, what will happen? Well, given the fact that this phase error builds up over time. So what will happen is, uh, if you uh, work it out, when you go back and do your inverse Fourier transform to get your image, so this is, you know, actual image, and this is, you know, reconstructed image, uh, what will happen is it will cause your brain to sort of like uh, turn into this kind of trapezoid like that. So here's your brain. It'll tilt it. And why does it do that? Well, if you had an X gradient on, it's going to, a spurious X gradient that wasn't supposed to be there, uh, it's going to increase the phase on the right side of the image and decrease the phase on the left side of the image. And so that will actually cause, you know, this part of the image to move up and this part of the image to move down. Uh, and so it will sort of like, you know, turn your image into, you know, your brain into kind of like a trapezoid like that, <laughs> non-rigid movement. Now, <clears throat> like I said before, um, it's, there's a kind of a preference for this because so, so what a B0 defect in, in EPI uh, results in, um, in a shift, spatial shift, but no blurring, but no blurring. So, so you get like a distorted image, but it's a sharp image. And so that's to some extent why there's this a preference for it because it, your image still looks sharp, but it's it's not right, but it, but but it looks sharp. Now, if you look, at, if you run this same argument for a spiral, uh, so you know if you start with a with a a line for a spiral, you'll see what happens with a spiral is, and say you do like a um, like an uh, inward outward spiral for instance so what will happen is at at the beginning when you're sort of spiraling around like that there's not much error and and the error will slowly build up and get worse and worse as you get out to the outside of k space like that and so the error will be worse you know worse out here over time because it takes time to record that and when you inverse fourier transform that so this is you know actual k space you know with with our error here error, uh, it will blur the image and so what will happen is you'll get a sort of a radial blur in the image so that the image will get a little little blurrier out here now is that better or worse not not clear to me it's almost like I'd prefer to have it just a blurred image instead of a instead of a sharp but incorrect image. But you know, beca and both of these, of course, there's ways of trying to to fix both of these. But um, so basically, you know, again, we assume um, spurious, you know, x gradient, and the end result is is blur, not shift. Well, it's a shift, but it's kind of a shift in different spatial frequencies. And so it, it, it turns into a blur. So, so the kinds of distortion that you get from doing a relatively long readout uh, in spiral is different than, 
uh, it's, it's an interaction of like something wrong with the B0 field and the fact that you're collecting data over time. That's the, the two crucial concepts, concepts to keep in mind. So, um, so in the last minute is what about gradient nonlinearities? Those can cause spatial shifts too. And what does that mean? It just means like you attempted to put a ramp in the strength of the BZ, the B0 field, with a gradient. And if, so, gradient nonlinearities. And so what will that do? That will basically cause a local Fourier shift problem. And so if the gradient is, you know, basically, if you attempted to do a gradient like that, but the actual gradient, you know, looks something like that, what's going to happen is at the places where the gradient is off, the phase is going to be off. So, you know, phase error here, and that will result in a shift. And that will result in a spatial shift. I mean, you can think of it very concretely. What is it? What's actually happening? You're just, you're stamping on a, st you're attempting to stamp on a stripe with the gradient, but if the gradient is off, it's going to distort the stripes. And so instead of stamping on sort of perfectly straight stripes, it's going to stamp on stripes that kind of have a little bit of a bend in them, like that. And then when you reconstruct using perfect stripes, it will do the reverse and, and give you a distortion. And so the good thing about this one is that you can just calculate beforehand. So the gradients don't change. Uh, and so you could calculate uh, beforehand and correct. You know, correct distorted image. So, so, so th this is this is a good thing. We can correct the distorted image because you know the gradients have a fixed nonlinear structure to them. They're, they sort of bend as you get away from the the center of the coil. And so, so this is a straightforward one to correct. This is a pretty big effect, actually. It depends as they've improved the performance of gradients. They've gotten slightly more nonlinear, and uh, <coughs> so. It, it's not a problem within a scanner, although it is a little bit of a problem if you put the, the head in different places in the gradient nonlinearity, but usually the head is about in the same place. Uh, and so generally different scans from the same scanner will, will be distorted in a similar way, but it's different between different scanner manufacturers. And so when you're collecting data across different scanners, you have to, uh, to worry about this. So, so it's, it's yet another sort of problem where you slightly messed up the phase also physically just thought of as you just bent your stripes that the gradient was attempting to spin phase stripes that your gradient was attempting to stamp onto the brain. Uh, and then when you reconstruct it with perfect stripes in the inverse Fourier transform, it results in the opposite, the opposite bend in the image. Okay, uh, so I think we can, uh, can uh, end the recording uh, there. Hopefully uh, I didn't get too close to nine o'clock. So 